My name is Emma Lee Locklear, and I live in the home place of my father, Hezekiah Locklear, who was the third husband of Maggie Larry Locklear. My dad uh, lived, we, we call it across the branch from where Maggie and her first husband lived. But he had courted her. Now, whether he went down to uh, the uh, Bud Oxenine Road where, where she was reared uh, or not, or how he got in contact with her, I did, wasn't told that. She did not marry him the first time. And uh, so he didn't get married. Uh, she married him, Aretha Chavis. And uh, they lived together approximately um, nine or 10 years. And he died. And again, my dad sought her for a wife. And Calvin Locklear won her hand. <laughs> and uh, they lived there uh, next door to my dad. And so he, he had to see her and, and uh, know uh, about her and undoubtedly observe that she was careful and hardworking. And Calvin went to Georgia and whether um, he died there or um, some stories say he was bitten by a snake, uh, he didn't return. And uh, after a period of time, my dad won her hand. <laughs> and uh, they lived, worked on that farm. He married her in 1909, and they lived together there until 1931. And she is buried at Prospect United Methodist Church in the a cemetery there, along with my father. According to my mother telling me that uh, Maggie agreed to marry him, provided that she was not asked any questions whatsoever about what happened to Henry Berry Larry. And he told her he would not. And I said, to my mother, and, and he never did, and she said he said he never did. And that was because she believed that people probably thought she knew, and she might have, I don't know. But uh, it wasn't something she was gonna talk about. There was a price on his head, and they didn't want that to be paid and neither did she want to be killed because of that information. She was invited to New York on two occasions. One, she was sent a ticket to come, and she did not use it. Another time, they wanted to make a movie and told her that they would put her up in a hotel and allow her to stay and, and feed her while she was there. And she would not go and do that because she didn't know whether that was a plan to get her off to try to get information about her dad. She was very uh, secretive in keeping whatever she knew. She carried it with her to the grave. It, was, it wasn't discussed. Okay, now I lost my father at an early age, seven uh, years old. And the story comes from people in the community that knew her, relatives that visited my dad and Maggie in their lifetime. And uh, I was told that she worked and ditched right beside my dad in the ditch because the land was covered with water when they acquired it. And um, she did not shy away from working, cutting wood, Whatever needed to be done, she worked along with him. Our house had two chimneys as well as a wood stove. 
So there was a lot of wood required for cooking those meals and uh, providing the wood for uh, the house. And uh, it was not unusual. She, my Aunt Anna said for Maggie to dance out a pair of shoes at one of those wood cuttings, that she was light on her feet, very um, active, and uh, just, just was just a, a doll out on the yard. <laughs> a wood cutting is where uh, families go into the woods and just trim up a tree and bring trees there, and they would cut up all night long. They played music, uh, they had, uh, you know, um, instruments that they played and um, they just danced and had a good time. Cut wood. I would like them to take away her tenacity to work, not only in the house, but in the field, and yet had time to put that quilt together. When my father died, he gave it and left it with my mother, Leola Locklear. And she treasured it because he had explained to my mother about her working on that quilt. And I'm almost of the opinion that she undoubtedly got the material through her three husbands because it is made of dress material and the, the little pine cone patches uh, as well as pants. So how she cut all that material and then put it together, there was no sewing machines in those days. And each piece had to be ironed and placed together for that quilt. I think it got its reputation uh, from the uniqueness of how she put those little pieces of material. In that quilt, each patch has 2,001 plus little pieces of material. Now, some people have tried making that quilt and have been successful. There have not been many, but for some that I know, uh, you had to take those materials, cut them, iron the pieces down, and then try to get them under. And I've never seen of those that have been made the unique way that Maggie put her patches together. When I look at it, and, and I'm not a, a seamstress, I'm not, I don't even sew, <laughs> but I admire how she put it together. And uh, the time, and uh, it was something that, that she was making and leaving for her people. Once people saw it, knew the quilt was here, I came in and borrowed it, um, handled it, counted the pieces. Uh, you know, something that had never been done at our house. I mean, it was really an heirloom. This is my way of trying to tell people about the work that Maggie put in it and uh, that I am just beyond words when it comes to the, the idea that it's a symbol now for our people. I knew it was special, even as a little girl, asking mom that I wanted that quilt. <laughs> you know, uh, people would come and want to buy it and she'd say it's not for sale. And I, when they'd leave, I'd tell her, I want that quilt. <laughs> I have nothing but the greatest admiration for Maggie Larry and what she put in that quilt and the heritage that she left to us as Lumbee people.